Good morning, everybody. It is such a pleasure to have all of you here. Um, as we approach spring, we're actually in spring now. Paul, if you would do a blessing for us this morning. Thank you. As we come together, we are thankful that we have a home. We have heat, we have clothes, we have food, and we have a place to rest our head. And we think of those who do not have that at this time. And we, we just consider them and, and pray for them that they would be comforted. We pray for the government and the decisions that they have to make both here in Canada and throughout the world that we can have peace and safety. We think of those that travel on the seas. We just pray for their safety and we thank you for them and for the truckers and for the, uh, the, the rail lines that are now open again. We're very thankful for that. I ask that uh, you would be with each one of us in the name of and with those that are, can help us and protect us. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you for doing that at the last minute. I do apologize for not getting to you sooner. Our land acknowledgement this morning, I would like to acknowledge the land on which this building is standing. It's the traditional territory of many nations. I honor and thank the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, <laughs> Haudenosaunee, uh, the Cayugas, the Huron-Wendat peoples, and the many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people now living in Caranto. Uh, and this morning, um, we are going to see a video called The Navigators. Are we not doing any toast? The toast? Toast. The Queen. Thank you so much. <laughs> and a toast to Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen. The Queen. The queen. And sailors everywhere. And, and sailors, sailors everywhere. 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 Thank you. I need that every now and again. <laughs> and as I said, we are going to be seeing the navigators, pathfinders of the Pacific. Um, I welcome everybody this morning. Uh, we have a smaller group than we normally have, but maybe we'll have a few joining us. I remind you of the Zoom meetings afterwards. Remember that uh, you have to sign in for them. Um, and our annual donations are way up there and we will have good monies for next January for our donations, so thank you. Our trivia today, upside down hatch covers. Hatch covers left upside down on deck are harbingers of bad luck. Any good sailorman can tell you that. In the old days, it was thought that such carelessness would give evil spirits a chance to sneak down and bewitch the cargo to say nothing of the water and weather that might get down below. Our shanty today is an oldie goldie salad. I thought the words weren't so necessary there because we did know that song, but there were a couple of words in there that I think are rather funny and I don't know whether you know what they mean, but uh, scrumpy and rumpy pumpy uh, is a good romp in the bed <laughs> overnight or not overnight. And I never heard the term before until I watched a program on a British calm and darned if I can remember the name of it right now, but it is a, a take on Shakespeare and it takes place on Shakespeare's life. And if any of you can remember it, I would be, I'd uh, welcome the name back. It's on PBS periodically and it's just very, very funny. Do you know it, Sherry? Oh. Uh, you're muted. What is it called, do you know? You're muted, Sherry. Margo, did you say you knew it? It's, it's up crow. It's up crow, yes. Exactly, up crow. It's wonderful, wonderful program. And if you have an opportunity to see it, I know you would enjoy it. I 
know, because it, it's just such a, a satiric take on Shakespeare. It's actually very funny and a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, very, very funny. They don't have it on all the time, but if you watch for it, you can record it and, and watch it at your leisure. Oh, and hello, John Jenkins and Seamus Stokes and James Winslow. Welcome, welcome. Um, okay, and today I'd like to thank Julia Morton Marr for giving us uh, a heads up on this particular video. Uh, it's, as I've told you before, it's one of the first and best documentaries produced about the, grand, the life of Grandmaster Navigator Mao, and I don't know how to say this, Pale Lug, Pale Lug, Papa Mao, it's a little easier to say, and the Micronesian people who have preserved the nearly ancient art of the navigation with stones. And so with that, please bring it up. Graham, thank you. Uh, so thank you. I, I put a note in the chat because one of the, as I read the description that Diane sent out, it uh, made me think of a book that I read a couple of years ago called How to Read Water. Um, and it's written by a master navigator, writer, adventurer called Tristan Gooley, who actually writes very, very well, but he explains in a quite scientific way in a couple of chapters of the book, um, how Polynesian navigators read the waves and swells to determine precisely where they were and where they were going. Fascinating read. And this documentary was great fun to see how it was put into practice. Of course, it wasn't just reading the water. It was also the star patterns and all sorts of other things. But because the wind direction uh, in that part of the world is relatively consistent, the wave patterns also are relatively consistent. And so they could use that as a basis for navigation. I found it fascinating. Okay, we have a uh, Ron. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I also uh, found that quite fascinating. It, it wasn't something I could have imagined um, as a technique of navigation to to find um, the the signals, so to speak, in the waves themselves. Um, and I thought I thought it might be less. Um, less explicable than it is the more you think about it the more you you can understand how how that navigational technique would work um really interesting deserves some study something that that sailors might want to learn for their own sake um you know if they're navigating in the pacific okay thanks ron uh next is julia go ahead well, I feel obliged to share with you why I asked Diane if it was a good movie to share with you because so many navigational skills now are being lost in Hawaii. When I was there with the schools, they invited me to go down to the Polynesian Voyaging Society that have created or made from mind, from the teachers, the elderly, of how to build it. They actually built it themselves with the young people as part of a student study. Um, and they built another one as well that went on the long voyage around the world. Uh, I don't know how many years the years go by so fast, but about four or five years ago, uh, it took them four years. But in that little, I mean, I can't even imagine being that close to the ocean with all the changing waves and things that happen in the sea um, to go around the world in a small canoe like that that you've built yourself is is quite something else in my mind but what i saw in schools are that on the big island they have a an arts and science secondary school and they're actually teaching how to Farm, farm fish, you know, fish farms, but in a concrete long pond. 
Um, they're teaching rope making. They're, I saw the kids carving a canoe under supervision from a tree. And I thought, yes, this is really important. And apparently what they used to do to get them get the tree from up on the mountain when, it, when it's finished, they used to slide it, cut a little pathway and slide it down into the water quite a distance. Um, one of the things that everybody was really concerned about was the loss of language. And every school that is a charter school now has, they're teaching both languages, both the Hawaiian and also English. They thought that the English American culture was taking over completely and they were, the kids who were Hawaiian born were actually not um, considered passing their school levels well enough. So now when they're in these um, charter schools, they're actually having to do twice as much work and learn all their own skills and they're all included for a time at the Polynesian Society, the Voyaging Society, and included in the learning of their original stories and building. Now, I could never build a wooden canoe at any point in my life from my mind when I didn't have even a pattern or a chart. I don't know about you. Um, I have lived in Ceylon, so therefore I know about rope making a little bit, but I also am concerned about the climate change on our little islands. I've heard only last week that they have lost all the beaches in front of the, this is on Oahu, Honolulu. All of those beaches that have been put there in front of the hotels right on the front have gone from sea level rise already. Um, the water, seawater is ingressing and it's very close to the fresh water on the island. That it won't take very long when they won't have fresh water. Um, the fact of the matter is that they get most of their food from the mainland and with so many aircraft not flying, they only have food for two weeks. So in my school peace gardens, they've been teaching them how to grow their taro and all their basic food supplies that grow in the soil there. And I was taken out to one of the taro sacred sites um, by one of the schools. They're even teaching on one school, a elementary primary school, they had a kindergarten group and the, the street people actually live, you know, as we as are in the streets, but they're on the beach. They're living in the natural way in huts that they build. And they've been invited by this particular school. I don't have the name in my head, sorry. Um, but they're bringing the mothers and their children to the school and teaching them how to plant the food that grows on the island. It's, it's just so precious. And the other lovely thing that happens. Every time any visitor like Fraser and I, when we visited these schools, we had to wait outside the boundary of the school. Somebody would come out and greet us and then they, the whole school would sing us in. What you heard in one of the chants um, along the way, I've forgotten where in the movie it was in the documentary, but that was the chant that they would sing and the person who greeted us would reply to say that we were safe people to have in to their community. I mean, it brought me to tears of course, because I'm a soft old thing, but that's so precious and they all behave properly. In one secondary school, they've got three outlets. They've got an ocean campus, this is the, the big island where all of the lava keeps flowing down, right? And they never know where it's going to come out of the volcano. Um, they have an ocean school, a land laboratory, and then a completely solar orientated brand new school up on the mount, up on the hills, so that it's up away from the ocean 
um, and they take it in turns, the two campuses or campi exchange a week at a time in the modern school. So they're getting an amazing education, far more than I ever had. Here I am with my little lovely group of people in ITEC who all speak at least five languages, five, at least two languages and more. And I only speak English. So, you know, I'd love to hear your stories about your navigation and how different is it from what you saw today? Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. I, amazing film. Thank you, Julia. I have two scientific comments. The first is the compass was invent was discovered by the Chinese uh, first and second centuries BC, and it evolved. The second one uh, is an example of scientific te technology leads to science conclusions. I did a Google search on DNA analysis of Polynesians and a 2006 paper popped up from the Molecular uh, Journal of Biology and Evolution, which verifies the evolution of the Polynesians from Asians in both mitochondria uh, DNA analysis, which is inherited through the mother's egg, and the whole cell analysis of DNA, which comes from uh, both the sperm and the egg. So this is hard evidence con uh, support of the drift analysis of navigation of the Polynesians from agents. So thank you again, Julia, for a marvelous movie. Okay, uh, Sherry, uh, do you want to comment on, or have a question? Yes, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you muted yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I find navigation fascinating. I was just curious uh, when this was, this film was made, this documentary, and I enjoyed it. And I do love navigation. Uh, in I think it was in the late 80s when I first started sailing, actually in the early 90s, I took a three-month navigation, coastal navigation course at the uh, Humber School. And I, it was just amazing. And, and just to watch this, but I was just curious when this documentary was made, because it was absolutely fascinating. And I have a son who will, I can't even get him in a sailboat. He only uses his canoe. <laughs> so I really enjoyed the canoe part of it too. Thank you very, very much. But when did this, when was this documentary made? Not so long ago. It was after my last visit, probably 2000 and I don't know, 10 or 12, maybe earlier. Than that, oh. somewhere after 2000, I know it wasn't made when I first went to Hawaii, and I've got 20 schools there, so it's kind of um, yeah, it's relatively recent in in the time of 80 years of my life, right? Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, next up is Shane. Go ahead, yes, uh, unmute yourself and. Anybody else who wants to uh, comment, please raise your virtual hand. Uh, this is just a, a follow up to Julia and to James. I came across a documentary a few years ago that was tracing uh, the genetics of the redheaded Maori in New Zealand. And there was some surprising information in that uh, they are uh, not specifically related to Polynesians. They are related, and this is specific to the red-headed Maori, um, they're related to Persians. So somehow Persians were able to make their way 
through to New Zealand. And the route that they um, have, have posited is that they made their way to the Canary Islands, across the, the, um, the oceans, ended up in Peru, where there are redheads, and made it to Easter Island. And there were um, um, encounters with um, European explorers, with a few islands of, of totally redheaded people in that area. I'm going to try and link the documentary if I can find it. I believe it's called Cousins from Across the Sea. It's not accepted by anthropologists at the moment, but uh, it's, I, I still thought it was interesting because somehow they made it and uh, it's quite interesting. Shane, if you would forward that link to me, if you find it, I will include it along with uh, the book that John Buckingham talked about. I will include both of those in the, the next missive that I send out. Um, I too would be fascinated to, to see that. Okay, uh, Julia, go ahead. Um, Shane, if you don't know everybody, has done major studies in Indigenous peoples. And really, Shane, have you been to Hawaii and had a look at any of the stuff that's going on there? I haven't. It's on my bucket list. I'd like to do um, South America and uh, head to Peru and... Uh, and, and uh, keep exploring the world. But this time I'd like to do it by boat. <laughs> and then you'll come back and do a presentation for us. <laughs> well, if, if these do satellites for Mr. Musk work, maybe I can do it live. <laughs> yeah, that uh, sounds like a plan, you're on. Uh, Claire, uh, go ahead, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question or uh, make a comment. Thank you, Graham. Um, the person, I don't know, my hand hasn't gone down, thank you. The person who is training all these youngsters is a man called Nainoa, spelled N-A-I-N-O-A Thompson. Now, if you put his name into YouTube, you will see he's given some major presentations to, um, in you know, ocean conferences. There's one excellent one there but he only talks story, just like we do here when people tell of their journeys on the racing vehicles or nearly getting um, lost at sea or that, but he uses the terminology talk story. And he is taking out 17 or 16 of those young people on this, when he went round the world with the canoe, the Hokulei, um, training a group at a time out in the ocean, putting them in the, he talks this, talks about the story of his father tying him to the boat uh, with, a, with one of their ropes and making him just float behind the boat the whole for a long distance when he got really seasick. Because once you're in the ocean, it, you, you adapt to the whole business of the movement. Um, and I'd love you to use one of his, his speeches, Diane, sometime in the future, if there's time. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, of course, next week, you know, we are going to be seeing uh, a continuation of what we've seen today. So some of what you're talking about will be covered. Um, I thank you all for your input and your comments about this very fascinating video. I personally will plan, I plan to watch it again. And if you know, uh, if you notice, I am, when we see videos, I always put the link in the missive. So you can choose to watch it again, if you will, uh, without having it through, you know, having the discussions and having it through the Zoom. It is not reliant upon Graham to put it up on screen. You can put it up on your own screen. And that's the same thing for next week. Um, we have next week worldwide voyage highlight video of the Hokulea. Um, and it traveled 42,000 nautical miles in three years and visited 150 ports in over 20 countries. 
to train a new generation of traditional navigators and to grow a global movement of Malama Hanua of care of the island earth. Here is a look at some of the highlights from that momentous voyage around the world. That's a 30 minute video and we will follow it with, uh, and I'm not gonna say this correctly, the Hawaiian language, he wa'a he hanua, the earth is our canoe and it's the latest voyage of the Hokulea. It's now traveling and it is a 60 minute voyage. And then following that, next uh, the week after that, um, I will do a presentation on the great boat lift from Manhattan during the 9-11 strike against the two New York towers. And so um, before we say pipes out, just a reminder, we will have breakout rooms. And if you want to join us, you must do so through uh, the click on the breakout room. Graham will set, um, will set that up for us. And so with that, Graham, pipes out. <laughs>